It's a great pleasure to have Mark Carliner here. Actually, we've had the pleasure of having him visit often, and hopefully that will continue um, if we behave well. Anyhow, he's not only going to be in the talk today, as you will soon hear, but he's a wonderful visitor and person to talk to because he's always so entertaining, <coughs> so interested in everything. So I hardly recommend that if you have any questions or feel like talking to him, you find him. He's in 908 for the rest of the month. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Dennis, it's, it's a real pleasure to be in NYU again. I uh, have enjoyed my previous visits and uh, I very much enjoy my visit now. And uh, at the outset, I want to apologize. As I'm sure you know, there have been some really earth shaking events in my country. And so I try to pretend things are as usual, but they're not. So sometimes I, I hopefully I will manage to focus throughout the talk, but I apologize in advance if I don't. Uh, I don't want to talk about it because it's too distressing. But okay, uh, I, that's all I wanted to say about this subject. So uh, today, <clears throat> I'll try to give you a, a lightningly fast guided tour on this topic, which has recently become quite hot because there are beautiful experimental results. For a long time, they were lacking, but now we, we do have beautiful, reliable experiments, and theory is developing in parallel with the experiments. And so I've been involved in the theoretical part of this and everything that I will tell you about my own work is my own work together with my partner in this uh, adventure, John Rosner from University of Chicago. All right, so, uh, okay, let's see if this works. Hmm. It might work before. Oh, so. it may not. No, it won't. Have no, no, it worked before. Anyway, doesn't matter. Let's not waste time. Okay. So, quarks, which are the fundamental constituents of all particles which feel the strong, so called strong nuclear force, are never alone. They always appear in clusters. And we want to know, what is that? It's some artifact of, okay. We want to know what clusters are allowed and how stable they are. And uh, our topic can be somewhat playfully rephrased. Our topic can be somewhat playfully replaced in the following way, that we are discussing <laughs> the social life of quarks, and we ask who is whom, for how long, is it a passing fling, or is it till death us do part? And uh, somewhat more seriously, uh, as you all know, quarks are fundamental building blocks of protons, neutrons, and all strongly interacting particles, which in our jargon are referred to as hadrons. And then I will borrow from Orwell, all quarks are equal because they all have colored charges, which are the same. But heavy quarks are more equal than others for reasons which I'll try to explain. And in the recent years, experimentalists have discovered reliably, these are, I'm just stressed, these are reliable experimental results, very reliable, new combinations that include heavy mixtures of light and heavy quarks, since these are unusual combinations. It's like an anthropologist discovering the nuclear family somewhere in the middle of Amazonas jungle can involve more than husband and wife. 
Okay, so we discover new ways that quarks can be arranged in stable or semi-stable clusters. And this includes a newly discovered tetra quark, tetra from four in Greek, two charm quarks, an anti-U and an anti-D, a theoretical, robust theoretical evidence for a stable exotic combination. We call them exotic because they are not the thing that we're used to C for many years, and so-called hadronic molecules, which is again a jargon that people use, but what it really means, these are analogs of the deutron, the deutron with one proton, one neutron, which are bound together, but the analogy, you can generalize this concept if you replace uh, in each of the proton and neutron, you put instead of one of the light quarks, you put a heavy quark, and then you get something like a heavy deutron. <coughs> so, you might have heard about the discovery <laughs> of pentaquarks by the LHCB experiment at CERN. And I will try to convince you that these pentaquarks really belong to this category of hadronic molecules. Uh, can I make a sure. very basic question? It's, I suppose it's difficult to distinguish between an actual tetraquark or two bond state of message or something like that. This is exactly my assignment for today. So I hope that by the time I finish the talk, the distinction will be clear. <coughs> And at least in some cases, it's possible to make experimental <coughs> measurements which make it very clear who is who. Okay, can I answer a question? All right. Sorry, one of this question stable means stable, stable, or is stable a... means <laughs> if. Oh, I see what I Precisely the right question. So stable in this context means a cluster of quarks which cannot decay via strong interactions. Of course, quarks can decay via weak interactions, but that's you know ten orders of magnitude in lifetime. So from the point of view of strong interactions, these are absolutely stable systems. Okay? That, that's what you wanted to know? Yes. Okay. Fine. So it's like having a new layer in the periodic table, and just since this is a colloquium, just a reminder, the history of physics in the last, I don't know, 200 years can be thought of as discovering successive layers of, you know, like peeling the onion, more and more constituents, mm -hmm. and the thing about the latest, the deepest layer of quarks is they never want to be alone. So you cannot isolate the constituents. And this is why it took so long for people to understand what's really going on. Give the wrong picture for the proton, right? Mm -hmm. There's no triangle, it's, it's my shape. Well, not quite, because Please excuse me for answering Sergey on a technical level, which, but Y shape, strictly speaking, we know for sure is there for heavy quarks. For light quarks, it's more complicated. Okay, yeah. we can we can discuss it. All right. So just to give you a feeling of what is involved, masses of quarks span a huge range of masses. In giga electron volts from around a few MeV by up and down quarks up to 100 and <coughs> roughly 150 GeV many many orders of magnitude and by convention up down and strange quarks are referred to as light they are below 1 GeV and bottom 
and charm are referred to as heavy and the top which is heaviest at all doesn't belong in our story at all because it's so heavy that it decays via weak interaction faster than the strong interaction can hook it up with other quarks so heavy quarks mean bottom and charm in this context all right so at first people identify some relevant symmetries that was Neumann, the founder of the physics department in which I grew up, and Mary Gelman. And then three years later, Gelman <coughs> and Zweig realized that this pattern of what we now refer to as SU3 flavor symmetry is, is obvious and natural if you postulate that hadrons are made out of three quarks together today we know there are five but the idea is is there uh, okay so all strongly interacting particles are built from quarks so proton contains two u quarks and one d and you see these black arrows they schematically denote the spins of the quarks so this is how proton gets its spin one half Two of the quarks point out, one points down, you add the spins, you get one half. And same story for the neutron. And then mesons are built of a quark and an anti-quark. And this is the quantum numbers of quarks add up to quantum numbers of, of hadrons and so on. Uh, now quarks carry color charge and the only allowed combinations, so only physical states are those where the color charges add up to zero color charge and in the language of group theory when physical object the only allowed physical objects are those which are singlets under the color group all right but there is more than these two ways to obtain a singlet for example you can obtain a singlet by adding two quarks and two antiquarks now a very important ingredient in this story is the potential between heavy quarks, which we now know as a result of many experimental and theoretical studies. I won't go into the way it was obtained, but basically, oh, sorry. Ah, I see what I've done. Okay, so it contains two pieces. One is Coulomb-like with fine structure analog of the fine structure constant with the subscript S, which, which stands for strong, which depends on the distance. This is the famous running coupling and a term where the potential depends linearly on the distance, this is what referred to sometimes as the confining force and potential grows indefinitely uh, between two heavy quarks until there is enough energy in the system for a light quark anti quark pair to pop up from the vacuum. Right, two heavy quarks, I mean a quark anti quark. Okay, so here yeah, you have for the for my education. If I would put in a log R term, for example, what would be the bounds on the coefficient? Oh, that's a wonderful question because, in fact, uh, for phenomenological studies, when people who calculate spectrum sometimes play with the logarithmic potential, and sometimes it's good enough. But as you will see, something I will tell you in the second half of the talk depends crucially on the fact that in the real world, at small distances, the potential is really Coulomb, not logarithmic. Okay. So here we have, these are not artists' concepts. These are results of the lattice gauge theory simulations performed by people in Australia, in Adelaide. And what we see is that the vacuum of QCD is such 
that if you take it heavy a charge and an anti-charge it's completely analogous to monopole anti-monopole pair in a superconductor a flux tube forms and hence you have a linear potential between two charges and this is what sergey really wanted me to say this is you see when you have three heavy quarks they don't form a triangle the flux tube point shot join at a central point and you have so-called y shape okay and now there is another example which shows something even more interesting again from the same group what happens when you take two heavy quarks and quark and anti-quark separate them from one another and you progressively store more and more potential energy in the field in the flux tube until the energy stored in the flux tube is greater than mass of two mesons. Then a quark antiquark pair pops up from the vacuum. And this is this simulation, which I really find stunning, because here what you see is that the beginning, the field is very strong between the two charges. That's the flux tube. And as the quark antiquark pair pops up from the vacuum, there is no field between the two charges because you have two independent mesons. So that's very nice. Okay, so standard hadrons are either mesons, quark, anti-quark, or baryons, three quarks. And exotic hadrons, the two simplest possibilities are two quarks and two anti-quarks, or pentaquarks, namely four quarks and an anti-quark. Okay, so the fact that you could get a color singlet from two quarks and two antiquarks or from four quarks and an antiquark is just group theory. There is no dynamics. And, and Gelman and Zweig realized it both in their first papers on the subject in 1964. But the real question is not the group theory, but the dynamics. Are these combinations long-lived enough to be seen experimentally and the answer that we have today is they are either st absolutely stable within strong interactions this is a big surprise because nobody knew whether or not this was possible i will show you at least one example where we know for sure it's true theoretically not yet experimentally and there are many examples where these systems are very long-lived in a way a stable system is kind of <coughs> simpler because when a system is stable, it means it cannot decay because it's either a ground state or there is some quantum number which prevents the decay. But when you have a very long-lived system, it's much more tricky because then you need to answer the question, what is the mechanism, the dynamical mechanism, which prevents the decay, especially if there's plenty of energy available? That was your question. And we have examples of systems which naively should fall apart immediately. And they're extremely long lived. And that's a very strong hint of how they are organized inside. Okay? And that tells you what kind of structure is there. Okay. So, there is robust experimental evidence for multi-quark states, also known as exotic hadrons, with heavy quarks. And they fall into two categories, mesons, which are not just quark-antiquark. And within that category, there are two important subcategories. One is with a heavy antiquark and a heavy quark, and a light antiquark, and the light quark, or two heavy quarks and two light antiquarks. And recently we understood that these two subcategories are very different. And I will spend some time discussing the distinction. The second category is baryons, which are not just three quarks, but for example, heavy quark, heavy antiquark, and three quarks. These are the pentaquarks. So there are three key questions in addition to what has been observed what else is there can we predict what other things the experimentalists 
might look for with a reasonable chance of success. Where to look for these things? How are quarks organized inside them? And by that I mean are there tightly bound tetraquarks? By tightly bound tetraquarks, it is a very clear technical definition. A tightly bound tetraquark is an object where each quark sees the color charges of all the other quarks. A hadronic molecule is the opposite. A quark pairs up with an antiquark to form a color singlet, another quark pairs up with another antiquark to form a color singlet, and these two color singlets hook up to one another by some weak forces, like in a neutron. That's a hadronic molecule. And there is, roughly speaking, an intermediate case where you have a dike quark, an anti dike quark, and so on. So, our job is, my job as a theorist, and John's, is to try to understand, find the answers to these questions, and I hope within the limited time we have, I'll be able to give you at least some taste of what is involved. So, there was a lot of excitement in the summer of 2021. This paper is from September, but the announcement was in July. They observed a doubly charmed tetraquark. Mind you, not charm and anti-charm, but two charms, two charm quarks, together with a light anti-U and a light anti-D quark. And how do they know that this is what they observed? They know because in the final state, they see two D mesons, one charged and one neutral, and sorry, two neutral D mesons <coughs> and a charged pion. So the total charge is plus one. And the mass distribution is very very sharp and it's just a tiny little bit below the threshold of d0 which is charm and anti u and d star plus which is another charm and anti d with spins arranged in this one into <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> so in D star, the spins are coupled to spin one, and in D zero, they're coupled to spin zero. So this object together has spin one, and this was a real tour de force of experimental analysis. It took something like two years, I think. And okay. so the parameters are interesting of this thing. What is the nine inverse Fentelbaum about? Here? No. There is nine inverse Fentelbaum, I use. Oh, yeah. What do they mean? This is the. Uh, the luminosity that was used so, so to extract this data. So, since it's hard to make these things, you need a lot of raw data finding a diamond in a haystack. The audience uh, of non experts uh, might appreciate it. I, I should explain. I should an explain. Like how many inverse Brentford Barnes does CERN uh, have altogether or something okay, like that? Okay, so, so this is just. A measure of how many, this is something like two years of data, I think. LHCB. And, yeah, LHCB, but I, I don't want to get too technical, but what it really means is, <coughs> roughly speaking, how much statistics you need to collect, raw data in order to sift through the data and find the diamonds you're looking for. This was very hard, a lot of clever filtering by experimentalists and so on. This goes, you know, beyond the scope of the colloquium. But, but maybe I should also inject, it's not like 
part two of LHC. It's the name of one of the experiments, okay. and the sub okay. B is the Thank B you. Quark. Thank you. So, <laughs> LHC, which is the acronym for the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, which has a circumference of 27 kilometers, has in it uh, four experiments, experiment called ATLAS, CMS, these two have discovered the Higgs in 2012, or rather announced the discovery after some years of collecting the data. There is an experiment called ALICE, which focuses on collisions of heavy ions to make quark blue and plasma. And there is an experiment called LHCB, which is optimized to make a large number of B quarks, and hence the B after LHC. And that experiment was initially designed to explore the CP violation as a conduit to physics beyond the standard model. But because they have a wonderful and very clever detector, they also made these discoveries in what we refer to as spectroscopy of hadrons. All right, so it's interesting, this thing is just, you know, a tiny little bit below the threshold, depending how you define your resonance using bright Wigner or something slightly more technical, but a few hundred kV. This is really very, very close to threshold. And the width of this object is ridiculously small, depending on how you define it, but it's below one MeV. All right, so we go back to your question. So this is a tightly bound tetraquark. Each quark sees all the other quarks, the color charges of all the other quarks. Or you separate them into two quark-antiquark pairs. And OK, we would like to know what we are seeing, which of these two. So. In that context, experimentalists produced a compilation. People realized that something like that might exist, have conjectured for a long time, and <coughs> there were many theoretical predictions. And then they gen compiled all of them, and for purely accidental reasons, our prediction is in red. And uh, our <coughs> prediction was based on the assumption that it's a compact object, where the charm quarks and anti U and anti D all sit in the same thing. And I will discuss it in a moment. So there are a few others which also fit very well. Are they all on comp, based on comp? No. Some of them, uh, at least one, is based on the molecular picture, but in the same paper, that completely wrong prediction for other things. So, uh, since you forced me to. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it might be, in the end, that what we observe, since it's so close to the threshold of two mesons, it might be a mixture, because in quantum mechanics, we learn from Feynman, anything which is not forbidden is allowed. Okay, so, since there is no quantum number to prevent, it could very well be that the physical object that we observe is some kind of linear combination, superposition of the two states. But there is another object when you replace the charm by bottom, which for sure is purely a compact, tightly bound, very small object. Okay, so. Hadrons with heavy quarks are much simpler because heavy quarks are almost static. They have very small spin-dependent interactions. And with this was a key to some earlier accurate predictions. And so what we have done is an ideal thing would be to solve quantum chromodynamics just like, you know, people do high order calculations in QED, which have fantastic precision. But in QED, the coupling constant is small. 
in QCD decoupling constant is running and in the relevant kinematical regime of bound states, it's large. And there really is, except for numerical calculations, no reliable tool to calculate anything from first principles. So instead, what we have done is we have adopted a phenomenological approach, uh, sometimes referred to as quark model, where you identify the effective degrees of freedom and their interactions. You extract the model parameters from experiment and then use them to make predictions. So apply this toolbox to, first of all, something which is entirely benign in the sense that it's just like the proton, except that instead of two U quarks, you put two charm quarks there. It's stable within strong interactions. Of course, charm quarks decay eventually, but that's on a completely different scale. So it's a heavy cousin of the proton, nothing exotic about it. And at the same time, there is this guy, which has the same two charm quarks, but instead of one light quark, it has two light antiquarks. And in group theory, this is very nice because this is a color triplet. These are color, two color anti-triplets, which combine to one color triplet, which is composed. So it's a nice exercise to do that. <clears throat> it's a excellent testing ground for the toolbox and we use that to make predictions for the mass of this object and in 2014 we wrote this paper predicting that the mass of the lightest baryon with two charm quarks is 3627 mev and we estimated our theoretical error at 12 mev three years later LHCB measured, discovered this thing and measured the mass to be 36.22 plus minus about half an MeV. So boosted by this, we, uh, you know, ours, we had no idea prior to this discovery whether our prediction would turn out to be accurate or not, and the plan was if it turns out not to be accurate, to do something else. <laughs> but since it did turn out to be very accurate, we, we got greedy and decided, okay, we can start applying this to more exotic states. And this is just to show you the lifetime. This is the measured lifetime. This is our prediction for the lifetime and some other predictions. And Okay, so how do you calculate the mass of the subject within this approach? The, the uh, recipe is almost too naive. You take the masses of the quarks, you take the interaction of the two charm quarks with one another, the interaction which is spin independent and the interaction which is spin dependent, and uh, the spin-dependent interaction between charm and light quarks and the mass of light quarks. Now, the things in blue we knew from other experiments when we made this calculation. The things in red, nobody knew because this is the first object that was ever seen with two charm quarks. I mean, it's the whole philosophy of this approach is you take it from another experiment. This is why people were stuck for a very long time. So. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused. What computation are you doing? You have a normal the mass of a baryon. But do you have a Hamiltonian that you're studying? The Hamiltonian says that the mass of the baryon is sum of the masses of the constituent quarks. These mm -hmm. are not the fundamental fields in the Lagrangian. Mm -hmm. These are quasi particles of constituent quarks whose masses you can measure in other places. Mm -hmm. Plus, the only thing there is there in the Hamiltonian, in addition to the mass of the quarks, is their spin independent interaction and the interaction of heavy quarks with one another. Everything else is absorbed into the masses. So that's, in that sense, it's almost too naive. Mm -hmm. But uh, you will see. Uh, okay. So 
the challenge is, okay, what do you do if you have no other experiment to take it from? You take some guidance from theory, make, try to make a successful educated guess, but you don't know if the guess is successful until somebody measures what you predicted. So what we realized is something people have known for a long time, that the algebra of color charges is such that in the limit of small coupling, the interaction between two quarks is exactly one half of the interaction between a quark and anti-quark. And then for reasons, no, we, we now understand why this is correct, but then we didn't, and we just guessed, let's postulate this is true. Also in the bound state where coupling is not necessarily small and the interaction, the strength of interaction between heavy charm and an anti-charm, you know from other states. So from there, once you make this assumption, it's downhill. It's easy. So, uh, okay, so I'm not going to go too much into this, just to show you, I mean, it's, it's ridiculously, it's, that's the Hamiltonian, or other, the values of the terms in the Hamiltonian. The masses, the binding, which you extract from charmonium, just one half of the binding of charmonium. And that's how the prediction is born. I thought that the picture was like that, sorry, I'm, I'm confused. You have CC are basically in a die quark. In a, in a die quark of the, I mean, they're like in a, in a three bar. So, right, so that they, they, are, they are attracting. Absolutely. And, and they're going to have some binding and they are heavy, so they're very small. And all the cloud of gluons and the light quark around is the same as in a meson, right? Exactly. That you can extract from exactly. B mesons and char mesons. Precisely. So this is what appears here. What we have is the masses of the two charm quarks, the mass of the glue and the, mm -hmm. the cloud. The only thing which you didn't have a priori is this binding, these two terms of the binding that yeah, that yeah. binding you cannot get it directly. I would not be able to get it directly from charmonium because in charmonium they are in the color singlet and now they are in a. But, but if you look at the Casimirs, yeah, yeah. color algebra if tells you that the Casimir of anti triplet yeah, yeah. is such that the binding of anti triplet is exactly one half. Exactly. If you so can use low very company. Mm -hmm. And then it's the, you know, you jump into the pool without knowing if there is water. Mm -hmm. You only discover. Afterwards. Afterwards. <laughs> okay. And it turns out the pool is safe. Okay, so. Maybe cruise, also it's a shallow pool. That's okay. Yeah, it could be shallow <laughs> pool. You could break uh, your neck. But survive might be worse. To survive. <laughs> <laughs> I already jump with my feet. <laughs> but anyway, these numbers are easy to get from Charmon. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. This is how this works. And once you have this result, you immediately ask yourself, okay, many years ago, uh, Bob Jaffe proposed that two U quarks, two S quarks, and two D quarks, <laughs> two lambda particles could bind to form a dibarion, which would be below threshold of two lambdas. And this has been going on and off, and nobody knows if this thing really exists. If, if it exists, it's borderline. But it's very tempting to say, okay, but if the two quarks are heavy, then it has a better chance of working because kinetic energy is inversely proportional to mass, so there is less repulsion. And you do a calculation, and indeed, the mass of such an object is below to lambda c. But it's a disappointment because it decays instantly into doubly chambarion and an ordinary nucleon. So it looks like you wasted your time. But it's an ugly duckling which turns into a swan. Okay, because then the next thing, and this all happened within one week after the experimental discovery of the doubly chambarion, we realized 
that now the same theoretical toolbox that led to the accurate prediction of the mass of this W trombarion, if you extend it to bottom quarks, by the same token, you say the binding energy of two bottom quarks is half the binding energy of bottom onion, immediately leads to the prediction that the analogous system, two bottom quarks, an anti U, anti D, is so strongly bound that its mass is below two B mesons, and therefore it has nowhere to decay within strong interactions. That's the essence of what's going on, right? So this is the first manifestly exotic stable hydrogen, and LHCb has the right tools to discover it experimentally, but they need much more luminosity. And this was the paper that was published in 2017, received 28th of July, I don't know, a week or maybe 10 days after the LHCb discovery. And then 10 days later, this was obtained using quark model. 10 days later, Quig and Eichten reached absolutely identical conclusion, but using a completely different approach, heavy quark symmetry. And a few weeks later, Voloshin with a collaborator used large and C to convince themselves this is true. And by now there is plenty of lattice calculations which confirm that this object is well below below <coughs> two meson threshold. Okay. So it's really there and then it becomes an experimental challenge to find them. Okay, I, I just want to use some qualitative arguments to explain what's going on. It's quite remarkable how much you can learn about this object by you know, essentially counting on your fingers. So look at the doubly charm or doubly bottom baryon. You have a dichwork, as Ricardo just said, the two heavy quarks sit on top of each other, forming a color anti-triplet. It's like a meson. Here is a color triplet. They combine to a color singlet. End of story. Now, in the tetra quark, it's the same color dichwork but the color triplet is now composite and a dike work because of the nature of color of spin dependent forces between light quarks the lightest possibility is when the two light quarks combine to spin zero rather than spin one and because of fermi statistics since these are identical particles and they combine to a color anti-triplet, which is anti-symmetric in color, they must combine to spin one, which is symmetric in spin. So by these trivial considerations, you immediately predict that this stable, heavy quadrat work has spin one, isospin zero, and positive parity. And you predict the mass and you ask the experimentalist to please discover it and you tell them where to look. Okay. All right. So quantitatively, people had understood for a long time that for sufficiently heavy quarks, this combination must be stable under strong interactions because the interaction between two heavy quarks scales like alpha s times mq. So for sufficiently large mq, it must be bound. But nobody knew whether charm or bottom is heavy enough. And the contribution of the LHCb experiment, LHCb experiment is to calibrate the strength of this interaction. The coefficient in front of alpha s square mq. Okay, so. That's where we are with this guy. And this is the analogous bookkeeping for the mass. And then, so what's really going on here? What's really going on is just as Ricardo said, when you have two heavy quarks, they get very close to one another. If you have two bottom quarks, 
they stabilize on an average distance of about one fifth of a fermi. Now, we all learned in the kindergarten that one inverse fermi is 200 MeV. So, one inverse fifth of a fermi is one GV. Now, since the potential between the two heavy quarks has this Coulomb piece, and this goes back to Eliezer's question about logarithmic versus Coulomb, you have one over R. And one over R, where R is 0.2 Fermi, gives you one GV. Even when you multiply by alpha S, which is 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you get hundreds of MeV. So this shows you that what we have been all told in graduate school, or maybe, I don't know, even as undergraduates, that at small distances, the interaction between quarks go, is very small. That's not true. What is true is that the coupling goes to zero, but not the interaction. If the interaction is multiplied by one over R, it's hundreds of MeV. This is the key to, to stability of this object. All right. So, I don't have much time, so just to show you, <coughs> there is a pattern. This is two bottom quarks, an anti-U and anti-B. This is when you replace one of the two bottoms by charm. This is the distance from threshold. And this is the guy that was discovered recently. That's our prediction, which was slightly above threshold, a few MeV. In fact, it's slightly below, less than one MeV below. And it's easy to understand why it is so, because you probe the Coulomb potential at smaller and smaller distances, you get more and more attraction. Very simple. And, but what is important is that LHCb, before it finds this one, which is hard because the cross section, production cross section is small, this one they have a real go at, and it's possible that within a year or two, they will find it. They're working on it now. And this one also is likely to be below threshold. So this one we know for sure is below threshold, the two bottoms. But there is a very good chance that BC, U bar, D bar, is also below threshold, also stable under strong interactions. And that will be quite a coup for uh, experimentalists that they want. So, this production, you can analyze. I, I won't go into this because we don't have time. I have taken too long and estimate the lifetime and so on. It's all in the transparencies, which I'll give you. This is the summary. I don't want to repeat myself, just the main point. The double B, PB, U bar, D bar, is below threshold, absolutely stable. Here, it's likely stable. <coughs> <coughs> the search is in progress <coughs> and this has been discovered just where it was expected okay I'm going to skip this now I shift it is impressive but I am afraid you, and yes I will not give me extra time for the talk is that right <laughs> If you it were up to five. me to give, I gave you. That's what I think. Oh, okay. Oh, but okay. it's not yours to give, so. <laughs> 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 All right, so this is a graphic compilation prepared by a Dutch member of LHCB, which shows the incredible diversity of hadrons they are discovering in the LHC. And a large fraction are exotic hadrons discovered by LHCB. All right, so now I want to shift gears. So I told you about this, at least one object, which for sure is a compact, genuine, bona fide tetron. I want to tell you a bit as much as Glennis will allow me until five o'clock that why we are sure that some of the things that have been observed experimentally are genuine hadronic molecules at the other end of the, the possible arrangements of quarks inside here. So there are these five mesons 
which share some stunning characteristics. They all sit very close to the threshold of two mesons, of two ordinary mesons. This is the distance in MEB. When they decay, they typically decay into, <clears throat> they have been observed decaying into quarconium, namely heavy quark, heavy antiquark, and a pion and pions with lots of energy. But there is something very bizarre about them. Look at this guy. It has phase space for decay of one GeV. That's lots. But it lives exceeding, it's a metushella. It, it lives incredibly long for a state which has at its disposal uh, one GeV of phase space. It has a width of 10 MeV. That's ridiculous. Ridiculously long lifetime and there has to be a dynamical mechanism which prevents the decay. Okay, and I'll argue that that mechanism is the fact that this is a molecule. So, all right. So, hadronic molecules are analogs of proton and neutron bound into neutron, and tetraquarks is the same for quarks, but sitting in the same color space. So what do we know? Experimentally, there is a stunning fact that this state can decay either into two B mesons, a B bar and a B star, or two B B bar and a pi. Now, the process in the denominator releases one GeV of energy, huge phase space. The process in the numerator, barely one or two MeV. Now, Fermi golden rule tells us that the width of a state is the product of phase space times the matrix element. So we have expect that this channel to be dominant, but it's the other way around by two orders of magnitude. So what's going on? Okay, what's going on is that the only way to explain this is that the overlap between the final state and initial state here is almost perfect, and here it's terrible. How can this be? If it's a hadronic molecule, which consists of two mesons, which are bound together, they barely manage to decay. Whereas if it were four quarks in the same space, it would be trivial for the bottom and anti-bottom to hook up to make epsilon and disentangle from the other quarks. So, these things have masses which are very near thresholds and they have the same spin parity quantum numbers inherited from their constituents. They have narrow widths despite very large phase space. And the branching ratio for fall apart mode is much bigger than into quarconium. And I'm going to skip this last point because it's technical. And now the, the next crucial step is to realize that this doesn't have to be two mesons. It can be a meson and a baryon. This is how we get into tetraquarks. And with John, we realized in 2015 that the lightest one is something called sigma C and bound to a meson called D bar star. And you can easily predict the mass and expected width. And this is a table of the decay modes that we published. And so we published a paper, put the paper on the archive, and then we are politely asked for by LHCB not to submit it to FISRAG letters because they are about to submit the experimental discovery to FISRAG letters as well. So within two weeks, the two papers yeah, so appeared in Fisrev letters, uh, not within two weeks. Uh, in two weeks they were submitted. Okay. Uh, it doesn't move, what happened? Okay, these are the two Fisrev letters. This is the prediction, this is the observation. 
And this is almost a perfect bright Wigner, but since it has a tiny width, 40 MeV, given 1 GeV of energy, and just below threshold. And by now they have better experiments, and they see that there are three states which are just tiny little bit below the relevant threshold. So this is a very strong hint that these are hadronic molecules. I'll be happy to discuss privately, but the clock is approaching four minutes, I think. So everything is as expected. I'll be happy to explain privately. You can also look at my transparencies. And by now they have discovered more of these things. Ah, this is important illustration. Why are these things so long lived? So imagine that you put all these five quarks into one confinement volume. Then this charm and anti-charm can hook up and say goodbye to the others. And then it decays 400 MeV. So there is no way if all five quarks are within one confinement volume for this thing to live a long life. It disintegrates very quickly. But if one charm quark sits inside the bottom and one anti-charm quark sits inside the meson and it's a hadronic molecule weakly bound, so it's large, it's difficult for the charm and anti-charm to hook up to make charmonium and this is somewhat analogous to problems that people face when they have a commuting marriage and they want to have children it's hard to meet it takes a long time so this is very strong evidence in addition to the quantum numbers that these objects are hydraulic molecules and the fact that they sit at the relevant thresholds of, of the meson and the barn i think by now most people are convinced that this is the case Sorry, sorry Marek, but those you showed... Are you giving me three extra minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it was for me, I would give you thirty. I know. <laughs> no, but it's okay. Let's, I can ask let's you later. wait till the end. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. Right. So, by now, they have seen also analogous states with the strange quark. Again, I don't, and we predicted the properties of these things, so I really have to rush. Even more of those. And now, just two minutes, I want to stress the difference between tetraquarks, which contain a heavy quark and a heavy anti quark, and tetraquarks, which contain two heavy quarks and two light anti quarks. For a long time, it drove me crazy because we have seen that you can have a stable state with two heavy quarks. Then why can't you have a stable state with a heavy quark and anti quark? It doesn't work. Naively, it doesn't make any sense because I just told you that the interaction of heavy quark and anti quark is twice as big. So it should be even more stable. So what's going on? After you understand, it's trivial. It is true that the interaction of a heavy quark and an anti-quark is twice as much as two heavy quarks, but they only interact twice as strongly if you put them in a color singlet. Once you put them in a color singlet, they don't talk to the other quarks, they disentangle. So there is no way to have a stable tetraquark with a quark and anti-quark, heavy quark and anti-quark. The only way it can work is with two heavy quarks because two heavy quarks on their own are not viable. They're not a physical system. So this is amusing, okay? All right, so, uh, let me skip this. And this is my summary. So I'm almost on time. So narrow doubly charmed tetraquark has been discovered by LHCB, where predicted. <coughs> the doubly charmed baryon was found exactly where predicted. A stable double bottom tetraquark exists. There is robust theoretical evidence and consensus among people who have worked on this problem that it is stable. And now it's a major experimental challenge, but I believe they will do it. 
there is a plethora of heavy deuterons, which really are hadronic molecules involving a heavy meson and a heavy antimeson, or a baryon and an antimeson, and so on. Many of them and many more will be discovered. And there are some interesting theoretical issues which have to do with Sergei's question about what happens when you have three flux tubes meeting at the same point. How is this expressing the mass of such an object? There is a lot of theoretical fun that you can have. And there is one state which LHCD discovered. It contains only heavy quarks, two charms and two anti-charms. So they have seen it decaying into two JSONs. So I think it's fair to say that there is exciting new spectroscopy awaiting discovery. There are at least three major labs which are producing new experimental results. LHC, in particular LHCB, uh, Bell 2 in Japan, and a Chinese E plus E minus machine in Beijing. That's three. So I'm having plenty of fun and I hope to manage to convince you that this is interesting and uh, tells us a lot of new things about QCD in non perturbative regime that we have not realized before. So thank you very much. I realized I was regretting after I finished uh, introducing him that I hadn't commented that he's the world authority on this, but now it's clear to everyone. Um, so let's ask first everybody from Ricardo gets a chance. <laughs> we love Ricardo. Also, we have many visitors for the next few weeks. Well, I'm here, as, as Glenn has said, I'm here. And I'll be happy to discuss oh, okay. privately as long as you might want to talk. Yeah, yeah, no, and we have time for questions, but I just wanted to let the non-particle physicists have a crack at it. Also, Eliezer Rabinowitz is here. This is David Greer. Hi, so I'm completely out of the field. I wanted to follow up on one of Gaston's questions, uh, which is um, when, when you say that a, a, an object is stable, um, how many nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds are we talking about? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> 10 to the minus 9 <laughs> nanoseconds. <laughs> First, so 10, so 10 to the minus 9 nanoseconds. Look, 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 look. Let, let, let me first give you a... You're joking. No, it's probably smaller than that. So okay. let, me first, <laughs> let me first give you a meta answer. In physics, dimensional numbers, in a way, are meaningless. The only thing that really matters are ratios of measurable quantities. So in that sense, these things are stable because there are 10 orders of magnitude between a typical lifetime of things that decay via strong interaction and decay via weak interaction. If you want to know in real seconds, oh, whatever it does, <clears throat> there is a transparency which we discuss. Okay, so 367 femtoseconds is the estimate of the lifetime compared to a typical lifetime of, of strong, in, strong decays, which is 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Does that answer your question? It really does, yeah. No, <laughs> but, but, but in a useful way. No, thank you. Okay, thank you. But it's an important question. So eternity, practical, this is practical eternity from the point of view, you know, there is 10 pi times 10 to the seventh seconds in a year. And here we're talking about 10 orders of magnitude. It's still something that you can reach with photons, so. Yeah, okay. Uh, continuing in the non-expert vein, uh, although this stuff is my bedtime reading, uh, do, uh, did I, be that a hexaquark is possibly a candidate for dark matter. You did read that, and and the author is standing next to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's Glenis's mm -hmm. idea. The point is that if such an object is bound 
sufficiently bound, it would indeed be a candidate for dark matter, which is made of ordinary matter. But there are some challenges, which include A, convincing yourself that the binding energy is big enough to prevent the decay of strange quark, for example, because there are supposed to be two U's, two D's, and two S's. And the idea is just like a neutron inside the nucleus is stable, even though a free neutron is unstable, if the binding energy is sufficient, that's a lot of binding energy, it would prevent the strange quark from decaying and you have an object which doesn't decay and then it becomes, in terms of its lifetime, a candidate for dark matter. But there is a second challenge, which is to convince yourself that even though it's an object containing six quarks, its cross-section when scattering on ordinary matter is small enough that you wouldn't have seen it until now. And that's not easy because the only way we know to make an object containing quarks to have small cross-section is to make the object very, very small. But if you make it very, very small, then the Fermi momentum, delta x, delta p, is large, and then it's very hard to make it light. So it's, it's very challenging, but I mean, we spent a lot of time arguing with Glennis whether or not this is possible, but it's a lot of fun to think about it. And sometimes, you know, you try to do one thing and, and you discover something else. Okay, did, did I answer the question? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then also Ricardo will get to it. Actually, there's a lot of hands. I will ask from, later. A lot of hands from non-particle uh, physicists. So please, Eliezer. Okay, so the first part is a commercial. So <laughs> did I just hear you defined as non-particle physicists? No, 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 no. No, no. <laughs> no there were non-particle physicists for their hands. Why did you try to create uh, disquiet here? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying there were some non-particle okay. physicists' hands, not his. Okay, so uh, first a commercial. Uh, many say, well, uh, LHC just discovered the Higgs, and what else did it do? And I think you saw here, I, know, I don't think it's complete, I think there's even an updated... Yeah, it's, 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 it's updating every couple of months. So, so there has been a large number of particles which have been, new particles which have been discovered at LHC. This is the, the picture for the commercial. Yeah, I have okay. to explain that Eliezer is the president of the CERN Council. <laughs> <laughs> and purely accidentally, he is advertising the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, And he's an say? absolutely wonderful person, as all our three guests are. Uh, so uh, that's the commercial. Then a very technical question. Yeah. If you go to your slide 11, the Australian slide. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you showed us how a pair of uh, of quark and antiquark can heavy stream. Quark, static quark and antiquark. They stream and the the potential between the disappears. The the, okay. So what happens in order to be able to trust for me such calculations? What happens if I put an octet on each side instead of a triplet? So in that case, I can't form a, a singlet on each side. Does these calculations show a difference? Okay, so again, just as I did before, I will give you a meta answer first, which is that your colleague, uh, whom you know very well, uh, who has received a Nobel Prize for QCD, David Gross, was very excited by this plot, and he believes it. You are still free not to believe it. Of course he wants to believe it, I've not heard No, no, yet. but as far as I know, they have not done the simulation with two static color effects. That's what you asked. Yes. To have an octet, then I However, can... after the colloquium, I will give you the email of Derek Leinweber in Adelaide, 
And you are free to write to him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but let me ask, Eliezer, uh, why, why you're asking this question? Shouldn't just two pairs form and break the string? No, no because but you cannot to... screen the octets. I can't screen mm -hmm. the octets, and I want to see that this happens. Then you I'm can gonna... screen the octets with If you have, if you have elementary quarks, quarks, if you have elementary light quarks, yeah, okay. in There's the no fundamental right. you can screen everything, right? What do you mean? If I have a three and an eight, I'm not going to form a singlet. Or three and an eight, or you're saying I'm putting an eight. Uh, but, you but, but, then you have, right? but then you have a string going to infinity, right? You, you, you don't have a total string. Okay, let's, let's, let's well discuss defined. it. Okay, let's take a couple of questions from non-experts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another opportunity for advertising. That David Gross is going to be giving a quote in about two weeks. But I think Ricardo also had a question. Yes, that's right, but he said he asked you after. Yeah, and there were two. Non-special, oh, please, priority. Please. I have priority. At least two. So one was uh, Nicolas. Yes. Right. So um, I can see, like, for the Cesar quark, it's very long lead. It can be dark matter. I don't know. On have uh, like macroscopic implication. But the objects that live like three hundred from those seconds, that they have a macroscopic implication that 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 they do exist. Like, I don't know. For, no. For I mean, at first, uh, thank you for for asking this question. So. When we realize that these things are stable under strong interaction, that's the first question we ask ourselves, can they play a role in cosmology, for example? Mm -hmm. And the answer is unfortunately no. And the reason is that uh, the uh, color singlets are formed just because of the temperature in the universe, roughly at one microsecond <laughs> from the Big Bang, 10 to the minus 6. But big quarks lifetime is 10 to the minus 12 microseconds. So by the time you form color singlets, the universe has cooled enough for confinement phase transition to take place and, and all the color singlets survive. There are no big quarks in the universe. I mean, there is a tiny amount, but the primordial ones have all gone. So this is, goes back to the question of time scales. Only ratios matter. And, and the lifetime of a big quark is much shorter as an absolute number divided by the, the, the time it takes to, uh, to cool enough that you don't see. Unfortunately. But we uh, pointed out in a nature paper that if you take, because of these effects, if you take two hadrons, two baryons, each containing one big quark, and they fuse and rearrange the quarks to make one baryon with two big quarks, where they interact very strongly, and one ordinary nucleon, you gain a lot of energy. This is completely analogous to nuclear fusion except you do it because what nuclear fusion really is, you take deuterium and tritium and you repackage the nucleons into alpha particle, which is very tightly bound and a free neutron, and you release about 17 MeV of energy. Here you release about 130 MeV of energy, so this is much more. And so we submitted the paper to Nature. It got very quickly positively reviewed and the editor called me and said, we're going to publish the paper under the condition that you put in the abstract a disclaimer that this has no practical application. <laughs> 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 because you cannot build a bomb with this because your fuel for the bomb decays, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> okay, so it was one other did you get an answer? Yes. I see one other hand up. Maybe not. Okay. Anyway, there's a reception after on the eighth floor. Thank you very much.